Julie, please tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Okay, so my name is Julie Merriman and I'm a visual artist and I'm living in Dublin. Um, my work is based in drawing, but um, due to the materials I use, I use a lot of obsolete office copying materials. And as a result of that, there is often um, a crossover with, I suppose, print. It, it looks like print sometimes, the work. And as a result of that, I've started exploring um, mimeograph printing in my work. So could you tell us a little bit about um, the, the Carlisle Pier residency you did? That was obviously a, a big piece of work and, and, and very relevant to us on the Ports Project because it's um, involving the, the pier at Dunleary. The Carlisle Pier was built in 1859 um, and it was also known as the Mailboat Pier. And it was the departure point for like hundreds of thousands of emigrants from Ireland from like from that date, 1859, right up until like late 70s into the 80s because I actually remember going from there myself in the 80s. Um, so I worked on that project between 2006 and 2010. Initially I was interested in the site because it was to be redeveloped. However, that, that didn't happen. It, it never got redeveloped. In fact, in 2009 the building was knocked down. Even the really nice Victorian, there was a beautiful old Victorian shed building there where the trains used to go into it. That was knocked down as well. And um, it's basically used as a car park now, which is horribly disappointing, really. Uh, you know, it really is. You know, having lived in Dunleary, I, I knew the history of the building. And, um, and as I said, I traveled back and forth there myself over to Hollyhead. And I was, I was familiar with, with the journey. Um, so I did a lot of research uh, before starting. And, you know, I, I looked in the uh, Harbour Company's archive rooms. Um, I spoke to local historians. Um, I put a call out in the Harbour Company's newsletter, and I had people who had travelled on the mailboat contact me from Australia and from lots of different places around the world. But as the project progressed, I became more interested in uh, in the site itself, not anything that would be redeveloped there, but in the actual Carlisle Pier site itself. And I was interested in the history of the building and and really the people who who left from there. And I may, and also the boats that had departed from there, like the Leinster and, and what had happened to that boat. Um, and, I, and I developed my work basically along those lines. So I looked at, I looked at all, of, all of that. And it was a long project and I made a lot of work about it. It was, it was really interesting, the, the areas that it, that it went into, yeah. What was the work that you did? What was the kind of creative response to all that material? Initially, I made drawings about that were just of the outside of the building, the building itself, the Carlisle Pier. Actually, I, I never actually made the only of the inside. I did walk inside around the building, but somehow or other, it didn't it didn't make anything about the inside. It was, it was the outside of the building. Then I travelled over to Hollyhead, made a drawing there uh, of the train station in Hollyhead. I wanted to make work to kind of commemorate the people who had left from there. Um, and I made a series of drawings. There's actually, there's a, um, a Vimco, uh, a, a, sorry, a conversation on Vimco.com between myself and curator Annette Maloney. Um, when we talk, when I talk about that project and it's got all the, the work I made. Yeah, so I'd also made a, a lot of images uh, around the notion of the Leinster boat that had left from there and it had sunk. I made images of sinking ships but not I wasn't necessarily I wasn't interested in it as a wreck I was just interested in the notion of that terrible moment when it when a ship actually sinks I delved into a lot of different aspects of of what had taken place on the pier on the Carlisle Pier and really it as a site and, and, and you know and what had happened there it explains really what I, I was doing. So um, just in that point, like when I'm actually making my work, I, I always collaborate with somebody else, with another, with other people, other organizations or businesses. Like I, uh, I, I need some factual information to start off the work. So I, that's why I, I always work with other people. For instance, I did a project then after the Carlisle Pier with Dublin City Council in 2014. And I was looking at the, the language of drawing and how it was used by a big organization. So I worked with the architects and engineers there and, and made work ar around that. And then another project I did in, in 2018, I 
received the GLR Lexicon Visual Art Commission Award. And for that, I looked at the interface of the language of drawing and other written and programmed languages used in the county um, at the time. Um, so again, I had to collaborate with numerous different communities and businesses and organizations. So um, in 2020, I received the Markovich Award and that was to reflect on the role and the representation of Irish women in the aeronautical industry during the decade of centenaries. So that involved collaboration with the aviation industry in Ireland. So every project I do, I have I work with another group or organization to, to, to make the work. So basically the same with the project I'm doing with you guys, course, past and present. So obviously due to COVID that has, has proved difficult. And um, with Dublin Port, I, it was kind of, I was okay because I, I was able to go down there and uh, walk around and made that first Dublin board so but I've kind of obviously this year I haven't been um been able to visit the sites like I would like to my proposal was to to make a series of postcards mimeographs specifically mimeograph postcards for the for the project I'm making work addressing each of the five ports so I'm making two postcards two different postcards for each port and I'm going to make them in editions of 50 so that will be 100 postcards per port and that'll be 500 postcards in total i've seen that the work you've done for the dublin ones are you thinking of carrying on in the same kind of vein in terms of the sort of industrial infrastructure or are you looking at different themes or what, what kind of approaches are you looking for different places no so that's an interesting question because um i think one of the reasons postcards are so popular is because they've got a really broad thematic appeal and so I decided that each port, I'm going to look at a different theme, if you like, for the, for the postcard. So with Dublin Port, I was looking at uh, trade and, and the movement of goods. I've done postcards for Hollyhead and Rosslare. I know Hollyhead Port. I'm familiar with it. I have, I have memories of it. I have photographs of it. I have information and of knowledge. And also Rosslare, the same. So for Hollyhead, I think I mentioned there when I, working on the Carlisle Pier, I traveled across to Hollyhead and I spent some time there, but I made a drawing, a big drawing of the train station in Hollyhead, but I had photographs of that. And so for the Hollyhead postcard, I've taken one of those photographs and I made it the stencil on the rhizo. And it's quite a dramatic, cause it's, it, the lighting was really good in this photograph, it's quite dramatic. So I, and it's, I've made the postcard for Hollyhead from that photograph, that's one of the, the postcards. I'm also very interested in uh, engineering and in, in, for, in naval engineering. Um, and I made another postcard that was a line drawing based on the blueprints of naval architecture. So they were the, they're the two postcards I've made for Hollyhead. And then the other port that I was familiar with is Rosslare. So Rosslare and Rosslare Port, they're places I'm very familiar with. I spent all my childhood summers in Rosslare and I also still visit there every year. So for Rosslare, I have addressed Rosslare, the townland, I've said different themes. So for this, I've addressed the townland and not just the port. And so for the Rosslare postcards, I use the memory of a house that's called the White House and it's situated on Rosslare Strand Road beside the Iona Hotel. So both the house and the hotel have been empty and neglected for many years. Um, and every time I visit, and I'd be there at least once a year, they deteriorate a little bit more. And I made some drawings of that house a few years ago. Um, and now for me, this house, it's kind of the quintessential representation of a summer house. And it kind of incorporates the same kind of transitory feelings I get every time I read or I reread um, Virginia Woolf's book, To the Lighthouse. Just something about it, that house always just brings it to mind. And so then last year in October, I read that that White House had been sold. And then in January, the Iona Hotel also this year was sold. So this little small section of Rosslare Strand is going to be completely irreconcilably changed in the near future. Um, so the two Rosslare postcards, they're uh, different views of the facade of the White House. Um, and I suppose they're just a nod to the ephemeral nature of place really. But so that, that's again a completely different theme to what I have for for a Dublin port, and then Pembroke Dock and uh, Fishguard, I don't know at all, and I've never been to, so I have to visit both of those, and I'm hoping 
maybe September, October this year. Well, September, I'd really like to go in September this year. That's my plan if things stay good. You know, the idea is, is that these postcards will be kind of collected and exchanged because they're two-sided. You've got this kind of public image on the front and this private message on the back. So it's quite an interesting dynamic. I look, I suppose, at, at language a lot in my work, um, like all the different forms of so visual, you know, language, programmed language, written language, all kinds of uh, different forms of language. And so, yeah, so it's really interesting. So on one side, you got the visual and on the other, you got the, the text. So uh, Deltiology, that's the formal name for postcard collecting. And it's, believe it or not, the third largest collectible hobby in the world surpassed only by coin and stamp collecting. So there's a piece of information for you. Um, but they're also collected as souvenirs. I was very interested in, in how I could use them in this project. Um, mostly today, like uh, postcards are, are photographic images. Prior to photography, they would have been lithography and woodcut would have been used to make them. And then in the 19th century, printing technology advanced and publishers experimented with special edition sets of postcards produced by artists during that time. And so I'm kind of looking at that notion, an edition of 10 different type of postcards for addressing each of the, the ports. So yeah, so the, the postcards would be standard size. Uh, they're 148 millimeters by 105. I'm used to making very large scale drawings. So this is the smallest size I've ever worked to, but it's really, it's, it, it's, it's been great, it's been really interesting doing that. Then I've also had, so you flip over the card and on the back, you've got your uh, place to put your stamp, your address and your text. And I've had a stamp also made up uh, that just says my name and the, the project name and then the project website. So, you know, as well as being information about each of the ports. Hopefully it will also maybe send people to look at the ports past and present project. They'll get posted around. Postcards are completely bound up with the idea of the picturesque, I suppose with some exceptions, but you know, it's, it's about sending an image, uh, an attractive image of a place, you know, which says you should be here or wish you were here. It, it really struck me that you started with Dublin uh, and you've got this port infrastructure and that's why i was interested to know you know how you were thinking about the other ports you know whether that was uh, you know the question is i suppose what what if you're in dublin port and you want to say come and visit dublin port see what there is here but of course that that infrastructure is is quite extraordinary i mean you know and to look at it you know architecturally yeah and i suppose then obviously it's i'm making them and so like ross Lair ports also probably got a lot of infrastructure in it. but for me ross Lair is really it's the townland of ross Lair. For me, it had to be that strand area in Ross Lair. Completely different imagery then to Dublin Port. Okay, so so you've got this sort of um, link you've got between drawing and technology, which is quite interesting. And so, you know, I suppose you'd say, would you say drawing is your primary medium, but the kind of visual language is very much tied up with print. Yeah, drawing is definitely my primary medium, and it's it's not just it's it's obsolete technologies that I'm using. Yeah, all these, these uh, the, the materials I use in my work. So um, I use like carbon paper, um, typewriter film, and I've also recently then started using mimeograph uh, wax stencils. And they're all obsolete office copy materials. And they're the materials that I use mostly to make the drawings. And what, what's drawn you to these, these technologies? What, what's so appealing about them, so attractive to you? Um, I suppose I knew them from, from when I was younger, I suppose my, my father had an office in the garden when I was a child and he used all of these, you know, typewriters, uh, guest definer machines. And so I was familiar with them. There are parts of my history and I just started using them in, in my work. I originally started looking at, uh, architectural drawings and blueprints, and I started out using the blue carbon paper. It's like any artist, you follow a thread. So I started with the carbon paper and it seemed to then, like I started taking the ribbons out of typewriter uh, cartridges, the fil the, sorry, you know, the typewriter cartridge film. So I started taking that out. And it was just true, it's a true process of um, exploring 
like if I do if I take this out and I put it on the wall and I draw over it, what will happen? Um, and that's really how I make all of my work by literally using materials and just seeing what will happen if I do this and then finding something interesting comes out and then continuing on that and and just that constant seeing what will happen when when you do something and how you then you realize that it's quite interesting and then you can use it I take these materials and I adapt them to my own way of working the carbon paper and the typewriter film they were kind of the work they produced had a kind of a, a binary nature to it. And, and that was drawing, but it had a, a, a very strong feel of being print. Like there would be two halves to each drawing. So there'd be an initial drawing that I would make, and uh, say if it was the either with the carbon or with the typewriter film, it left behind a negative of the original drawing in the typewriter film. So I started pinning that, that back onto the wall and then drawing over it with a pencil to push that negative image back onto the page. And from there, then I started looking at the, the mimeograph, which, so that was a form of stencil duplication. It's basically following a tread. There's obviously a particular kind of aesthetic that, that comes up with these, this technology. I was just thinking, you know, this kind of retro feel that there is in, 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 the, in the, you know, the use of these technologies. You know, when, when Photoshop was kicking off, even then, in like 1995, there was a, a Photoshop filter for photocopy. So I was just thinking that even then there was this idea that there was a kind of an aesthetic in these printing technologies that people might want to reproduce having put their photographs on the scanner and then put them into Photoshop, put a filter on them. There's something quite attractive about that kind of primitive printing aesthetic, I suppose. Well, the Gestetner was originally you know, in the end of the 19th century when it was developed. So kind of it, it initially uh, before that um, office play office environments, they would, you know, have to copy things by hand. And so then David Gestetner came along with this invention. And so first of all, he had the, the, the wax stencil, which was like a, the stencil paper and behind that was the carbon paper and then a card and he clipped the three together and so you had this kind of floppy piece of paper and he invented a little um a, a cyclo style wheel a little a, a pen with a wheel on the top of it that you could roll and you could um pierce the the wax um so that then you could um put the ink would go through it and that completely revolutionized the way people worked in offices because you know you didn't need somebody there copying things by hand anymore you could make these uh, very quick uh, cheap and efficient way of producing documents and he couldn't like he developed lots of different kinds of first of all manual duplicators and i have a lot of those started from about the 1890s little small manual uh, guest editor duplicators and then he went on and he made a lot of, you know, mechanical duplicators and, and this with a rotating, a rotary drum would have inside the, the machine and you could put the wax stencil then onto the drum and you can either manually roll it with a, a handle or you can plug it in and it's an electric thing. The company, Gestetner company, continued to improve their Gestetners and their duplicators up until around late 1970s when the photocopier came in and that basically they became obsolete um but kind of i think like a lot of artists now not so so much maybe here but definitely in europe um have started looking again at this aesthetic of the guest ethner and um and this method of printing this duplication and there's actually a a guild uh, the duplicators guild now set up. They had an exhibition recently, Gestetner 140. So it was 140 years since the Gestetner was invented. Yeah, they had an exhibition online and I had some of my work in that as well. So, so the word um, mimeograph then is, so it comes from obviously mimeo, like copying. And so, so sometimes it's called mimeographing. So it's a verb as well as a noun. The act of producing the work is mimeographing, but the actual thing you produce is the mimeograph. And there's, then there's different kinds of stencil duplicators. And so there's the Gestetner, and that's the one I like, I'm i really interested in. But there's also um, a Riso machine, which was developed um, in Japan. That's much more commonly used, and it's still used. That's not an obsolete machine at all. That would be used 
a lot by graphic designers and, and, and lots of and artists as well. A lot of people would have would use them, but it's also it's a stencil duplicating process. Sometimes I will I have a riser machine, but I use it not to actually print on, but just to um, make stencils on because basically the wax stencils for the guest etna are really hard to come by. So all of us people who are interested in guest etnas, we have a problem finding the wax stencils. There's a possibility of getting some from Japan and or China maybe, but you have to buy in such bulk. So anyway, there's little complications. You can use the riso, you can make your image on, on that, and then you, you have to have interrupt the machine so you can take the stencil off it before it prints. So you have to do a little messing around with your machine to do that. And then there's another machine you can use. It's a dot matrix printer. So that's like, um, you, you can also make a stencil on that. And that's just kind of a thing where you, it kind of basically is like a hammer and it just hammers onto the ribbon. And that's how it actually works. Like a oh, series of little pins and they hammer out the, the image. So I, and what if I make a stencil on that, I'll take the ribbon out. So there's lots of ways you can make the stencil, but all of them then I will print on my guest actor machine. Is that, um, I'm thinking about these machines, are they all kind of huge machines and they will take lots of space up or are some of them smaller? Or? There used to be really big ones. Um, I remember as a child seeing a really like six, seven foot machine, like a really big one. Mostly they're, they're small, you put them on top of a tabletop. Um, so they're, they're not massive or anything, no, they're tabletop machines really, you could, you know, and you, and you can get them then in various sizes. But they were also, they weren't just used by people in offices. They were also used, in, particularly in the 60s and 70s, by um, poets and writers who could use them then to um, to be able to make their own work. So it gave them a great freedom. You didn't have to, you could do it do it yourself, DIY, zines and things like that. They, they were used by a lot of um, diverse communities around the world, like. So there's quite a kind of creative lineage in there as well, outside of all of the kind of commercial purposes. Yeah, there is a great, really good creative history to them. There's all kinds of other residences, like the dot matrix, for example, some of the images you've made using that technique, you know, have this kind of almost pointless style to them. So there's all these kind of residences, you know, throughout that, that come up. If you're using the guest art wax stencils, I'll always use that for hand drawing, so I'll draw and I have a whole range of different pens, not just that little one I mentioned earlier with the, the wheel pen. He devised a whole pile of other different pens then that give different effects. And also there was, uh, there's plates with textures on them. So you can put the plate onto the stencil and you can rub on it and then you'll get a, a kind of a different texture. So, so that's one way, but you can also type on that stencil as well with a typewriter so you can make text. The Riso stencil is great if you're using if you have a photographic image, that's good for that because you, you can get quite a dramatic effect with it. And then, yeah, and then the dot matrix has a whole other, whole other kind of like, pointless like image as well. Yeah, so. You were interested in the idea of, of artist books. Um, yeah, so print has become a much more active medium in my work, mimeograph printing. Um, and I started making um, kind of book art and it's been really it's a whole different mindset of working, but I'm, I'm really interested in it. And I only make small editions of the books that I've made so far, just, you know, 10, 20 copies. So I haven't made anything more than that. It's like a small exhibition space for something that I want to talk about, if you like. I mean, I, I always think books for adults. Why is there no pictures in them? I mean, I, I like I, I read a lot. <laughs> So my books are mostly image based. I'll have a piece of text at the beginning, maybe a little bit of information about what the imagery is about, but they're, they're image based books and it's, it's, um, it's, it's a wonderful way of working. I, and I'm making stencils from the three different type of methods I mentioned earlier and, and, but then printing everything on the guest etner. The aesthetic of the print from the guest etner is it's, it's so not perfect. It, intrinsic limitations to the to the process but as an artist yeah I, I like that are they all monochrome or is not necessarily monochrome is it no i have original guest stefner's inks in uh in a couple of colors of them that i've managed to to get they're not made anymore so it's um, an online auction site where i might buy uh in france i, I got a, an online auction site there where i bought a lot of orange guest stefner ink and um, which was was great you can use uh, Riso have really good soya-based inks, 
um, and they've got some really nice properties. So I'm, I might occasionally use them too. Uh, yeah, so it's not just monochrome. There's so much more you have to think about. There's all that layout and uh, you have to, your sizing of everything and then how you're going to put it together. So uh, Gestetner used to produce a newsletter every year and they had a way of folding that book into place. So in all of the books I make, I follow their method of uh, folding the cover and placing the, the, you know, the pages inside. So I, I like that I'm, that I've the materials and, I, and I'm following that, uh, that method they have of, of, of assembling the book and presenting it as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really true to the media bit, isn't it? Yeah. Again, all the time you're trying to adapt what you, what you have to, to what you want to, to make. I'm trying to use these stencils, not, not just as books or like, as, or the, like the poster, not just for small things. I'm also starting to adapt them to use in the large scale drawings as well. And so I'm, I'm working on that now. How can I, how can I use these stencils that are really, I suppose, designed for A4 size, but how can I adapt them so that I can actually use them in much, much bigger imagery as well. So all the time you're trying to find something more out and push something a little bit more, um, again, just to see what will happen. You said there's a big change there between, you know, the postcards and the books and those big drawings that you're making for Color RP and the other projects like that. So that kind of scale is quite impressive range there. Yeah. And then you've got quantity versus the scale as well. So there's that thing too, yeah.